Yeah, I will present the aforementioned uh, title. First, I want to give a small uh, outline. We'll start with the motivation, go to the experimental part of this uh, presentation or project, go to the numerical part and show some results, uh, which is our current state, and then sum it up. So, to motivate this uh, CTLE-based crack growth law, we have to go basically in our previous projects in which we uh, um, developed the state of the art TMF uh, lifing model for um, our material here. And we can see on the right side, where is the data for that? Okay, on the right side, uh, turbocharger housing with an ink marked crack. And on the bottom, we can see the uh, lifetime simulation with um, a red marking for a position where the crack could initiate. And we can see that we have some good coincidence. And the question is now, what happens when those cracks grow? Um, do they arrest or do they uh, lead to a failure of our parts? And currently, there is no tool to predict um, the propagation of cracks of size similar to the components uh, of the dimensions uh, under TMF loadings. And so our aim in this project is to develop, develop an experimental databases for the material and you resist D5S and to have a numerical tool to predict the crack extension, the components. And this numerical tool is basically POCAF Plus, which has been presented by my colleague uh, Pavel Ganesh. Um, for the experimental design, We've uh, we got four different stages for the experiments. So we started with uh, LCF experiments on smooth samples. Those have been used to uh, check our current batch of material to compare it to the previous batches of the material we uh, received in the uh, previous project to see whether or not the material still is behaving in the same uh, fashion. And we also wanted to see how uh, big are the uh, uh, how big is the size of the incipient cracks after, uh, at the end of the LCF experiment. Second part were isothermal crack propagation tests. Um, these are used for the calibration of the crack propagation model. Um, we are using three different temperatures, so 12, uh, 20 degrees Celsius, 500 and 700 degrees Celsius as our higher temperature uh, regions. And the anisothermal TMF crack propagation tests are done in a temperature range from from 400 to 700 degrees Celsius with a 5 Kelvin per second uh, temperature rate. And in the end, we have some complex validation tests with different uh, geometries for our specimen to see, uh, to see whether or not the crack propagation model still uh, is valid. Our testing setup is um, shown on the right side. Left, we can see the specimen with our rectangular uh, testing area. We have a, a U-shaped notch in the specimen, which is manufactured by EDM. Um, and we can see here an extensometer, a potential drop uh, uh, wire, and uh, we have induction coil heating and a thermographic camera. And the base idea for our crack growth monitoring is that we have, uh, in this case, like four different methods that we combine to have a um, good calibration for our uh, potential drop uh, method. So we're using compliance data, thermography data, heat tinting, and the uh, potential uh, drop readings to basically calibrate our uh, Johnson function. In this case here we can see um, the combination of all isothermal experiments, so all data are gathered, and an exemplary Johnson function uh, with a y value of 0.5. We can see in red the thermography uh, data readings, which are a little bit below the other readings, since we are only seeing the outside of the specimen. <coughs> and we can see in black our called surface. So this is the heat heat tinted surface of the specimen after the experiment. And in yellow, we see the compliance data with a little bit of uh, artifacts here. But overall, our data has a good agreement. And what we do is we uh, fit for each specimen, the Johnson function particular only to this uh, data, basically, to have a better um, yeah, crack growth uh, reading um, for each specimen, since we have very heterogeneous material, and uh, this is a necessary step here. Here we can now see the isothermal uh, results. 
from the isothermal crack propagation test. Um, they are represented in a delta K DADN diagram. And what we can see here is uh, we have separation in terms of R ratios for uh, each temperature. So the 0 0.5, for example, here for 700 degrees Celsius, R equal to 0 and R equal to minus 1. And the same goes for room temperature. And also our dwell time is separated from uh, the other uh, curves. And the curves itself are somewhat showing a, like a yeah, curved uh, behavior in this diaphragm, which is not very optimal. And we are trying to solve this issue uh, with our delta, uh, our delta CTOD as a crack propagation, uh, as a crack mechanical parameter to, to describe the crack growth. Next slide are our TMF results. So we have uh, in-phase experiment in black, out-phase experiment in red, and we are also seeing uh, the same separation again. So we have the separation for the in-phase experiment which has shifted a little bit to the left, um, and we have the separation in R ratios again. Um, and uh, so this is uh, very similar, and, and overall all these curves are um, also shifted again uh, compared to the previous uh, slide where we only had uh, the isosomal data. For our simulation technique, we are using a 2D simulation and a half crack uh, specimen. Um, the specimen itself is uh, yeah, split into two parts. So we have a, a top part, which is basically a linear elastic model with an increased stiffness to uh, basically um, accommodate or um, capture the effect of the uh, thicker part of the specimen and the clamping. And in the bottom we have the viscoplastic uh, material uh, and uh, some contact zone which is basically the crack and our Y symmetry since we're using the half crack model. Uh, we're using special collapse elements as a crack tip which, which give us a better uh, yeah, con um, convergence behavior so we can, we can use uh, a larger mesh in total and we're using a large strain, large rotation model since we're using a remeshing technique uh, and um, what we're doing is we extend our crack a little bit uh, which is in this case like a delta A equals to two, uh, alpha times delta CTOD and in our case we chose alpha as 25 and after the remeshing is done, which is done in the initial configuration we're applying the deformation state onto the uh, new mesh from the old mesh and then we are mapping our internal values to keep basically uh, our uh, yeah, plastic, our inelastic deformation uh, information and the history information and we have to also correct those internal values since uh, mapping introduces some uh, non-physical uh, values for some of these um, map variables and this is comparable basically to what happens in the Vulcan Blast. So here are now all the results. So we have uh, simulated uh, most of our isothermal experiments up to this point. And we can see that the curves are coming uh, a lot closer together compared to the delta K representation. You can also see that most curves have a very like, linear uh, shape in this diagram. Um, and except for, uh, which is not marked here, the uh, R equal to 0 0.5 with this, uh, this black curve for room temperature, all other R ratios fall more or less on top of each other. Same goes for the 500 degrees Celsius case. And we still see for 700 degrees Celsius a separation in R ratio. So this one here is R, uh, R ratio to 0 0.5. These are the R ratio zeros and R ratio minus 1. And we are trying to improve this uh, diagram by uh, using um, the delta CTOD plastic uh, in, uh, in the future and trying to get an even better representation of our crack propagation data. To uh, sum it up now, so we calibrated our Johnson function for each specimen on its own to, to get a better crack growth reading. We uh, 
use the representation of uh, delta CTOD, which is already uh, better than uh, only the delta K um, representation. We're trying to use uh, the delta CTOD plastic. We yeah. already tried it out a little bit, and it seems to give us a little bit better uh, representation of the data. And we have to still simulate our TMF experiments. And uh, at this point, we would basically uh, build a crack growth law in terms of a phenomenological model that is similar to the uh, Pappas law, basically. And some acknowledgement from uh, BMWI and uh, IEF for our funding of our project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, clear presentation and also for keeping the time. The paper is now open for discussion, please. Yes. Yes, it's, uh, two short questions. Can you look at the stability of your microstructure after exposure to 700 centigrade? And second, you haven't mentioned protective atmosphere, so just have you looked at the oxidation effect? Yeah, so um, I'm currently having like two specimens uh, sent for uh, checking how the uh, oxidation develops. And uh, we've not looked uh, at the uh, microstructure uh, after uh, the high temperature. Okay, yeah. um, do you think the predictions that you might be able to get from your uh, numerical models are also applicable to uh, real um, geometries or real cases and 3D, also because you are simulating a 2D probe? Yeah. So, uh, in general, this is a topic where uh, the group of uh, Mr. Kuna is working on. So in our case, we are only using like the 2D uh, approach, and so we only have uh, more or less mode one here. Um, Mr. Kuna and his colleagues are working on uh, trying to find a way to get this, uh, get basically an equivalent uh, delta CTOD for 3D, um, so that it's applicable for uh, yeah, more complicated geometries and loading cases. Okay. Yes, please. A question to your potential drop measurement in the TMF experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, you change the temperature and so you change the electrical resistance of your material. You have to yeah. recognize this in any way. Can you tell me about that? Well, the thing is, basically what uh, I mean, what we're doing is, uh, okay. this is the wrong direction. We have to choose a specific point throughout the, uh, like the cycle. And uh, in our case, we always try to go for the highest, uh, uh, the highest potential reading throughout one cycle. And uh, since we're using a like a potential ratio, and we're always trying to use the same temperature at which we read this okay. uh, ratio, it should. Uh, okay, yeah. so you, you don't measure uh, continuously through your uh, temperature cycle. You just measure at the highest temperature. So. Basically, you measure throughout the whole cycle yeah. to keep the temperature. But you assign it to the highest temperature. Exactly, yes. Okay, thank you very much for the question.